Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Atkinson. I'm the Vice President of Wealth Management. Really excited today for our uh, webinar. We're going to talk about uh, the market outlook and insights. And very excited to have Brian Yu, the Senior Economist of Central One Credit Union, to uh, speak. Uh, Brian is an instructor, uh, has been an instructor at UBC. Uh, he's been an economist for BC Real Estate Commission, and he's also been an analyst for CMHC. So he has some really good insights to the economy today, as well as um, speaking about the real estate market as well. Um, we have a really uh, packed uh, presentation for you, but there may be some time for questions at the end of the seminar um, or the webinar. So please, if you do have some questions, feel free to enter them in on your WebEx panel at the bottom of the right-hand side. There's an opportunity there to enter in questions. And uh, time permitting, we'll let uh, Brian uh, answer some of those questions. So uh, without ado, I will uh, pass it over to Brian. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Michael. It's, uh, it's great to be here and to uh, and thanks to GNS for uh, organizing this session. So today I'm just going to give a, a, a relatively short uh, 25 minutes or so uh, overview of what's happening in the economy and where we see it going. Um, so we're going to start with a, um, a quick overview of the sort of the global, uh, current global events, global economy. We'll move it down to about 10,000 feet to uh, what's happening in Canada and uh, the interest rates and exchange rate type of environment. And then we'll, uh, we'll move into the, the BC environment. And if we have time, well, I'll get into a little bit more on the, on the Metro Vancouver housing situation. Um, so currently, uh, let's start with the global, the global picture. Uh, I think it's no exaggeration right now to say that uh, this has been a pretty disappointing year for global economic growth. Uh, it's an, and it's also very volatile for what's happening in financial markets, uh, particularly in the beginning uh, part of the year. Um, despite what we were seeing as a historically low interest rate environment, uh, the economy really remains mired in this low growth state uh, with very little in the way of traction. Uh, when we look at some of the key indicators that we look at, um, such as global manufacturing trends, um, service and global service trends, uh, it all points to some, a lot of growth deterioration in, in the, uh, the beginning part, first quarter essentially, and even into the second quarter. Uh, we've seen some weak trade flows, and, and all of these have contributed to those swings that you saw early in the year, anything from a $0.67 cent dollar, a $27 oil, uh, equity markets um, uh, weakening. Uh, all those have stabilized, but again, it's a reflection of what we're seeing in the, the broader environment. Uh, when we're looking here at this chart, what you're seeing is the International Monetary Fund's um, forecast for economic growth. Uh, they're looking at about a 3.1% uh, growth rate this year. Uh, one thing to note here is that it has been a, 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 essentially a serial disappointment for uh, on the global, uh, global space. Uh, we're below the 15-year average of around 4%. And even if we look post-recession, um, uh, we're actually trending below uh, the post-recession average growth rate, which was around 3.4%. Uh, so we aren't picking up a lot of traction right now. Uh, to be clear, um, the, it is a longer and drawn-out recovery is, uh, is expected, largely because this was a balance sheet recession, a debt field recession, uh, part in Europe as well as in the U.S. Uh, but also part of the reason for this lack of uh, gains has been um, a lack of fiscal policy uh, or um, loss, a lack of uh, fiscal expansionary policy, uh, despite the fact that the uh, interest rates remain so low. So we do a quick scan of the, um, of the broader economy from the G20 or the largest economies in the world. What we're seeing is that um, there are a number of factors here that are driving this slow growth period. I've already mentioned the fiscal, uh, lack of fiscal stimulus, but also there's a lot of rebalancing happening. Um, the fact that oil prices are so low and we're seeing a lot of a big drop off in the uh, metals and mining prices has really impacted some of the higher growth emerging markets where uh, areas like Brazil are in a deep recession, Russia is also in recession, Argentina here is also showing negative growth. Um, this is also hurting government finances and other commodity producers as well. Uh, when we look at China, there are some growth, uh, high, relatively higher growth stories. If you look at India, it's a very strong, right now India is the uh, the beacon, I guess you want to call it, of, of growth for uh, the global economy. Uh, China is still growing at a relatively uh, moderate p 
case, of, uh, over 6%, which would be great if you were in an advanced economy. But uh, it is below what the government in China has wanted uh, and what they're targeting of, of around 7%. Uh, what's happening in China is that they are undergoing a ongoing internal rebalancing, just as uh, some of the other markets are, ad are adapting to low commodity prices. Um, China is moving more toward a market-driven economy. They're also focusing more on consumers and services uh, type of growth, uh, rather, and also trying to mitigate some of the impacts of the building boom and excess supply of, of, um, of building and lending in, in previous years. Um, in the long term, this is good. Uh, a stronger uh, consumer growth demand in China is good, but it does have negative impacts for the broader global economy uh, insofar that uh, there is less demand for or weaker demand for commodities and industrial products and also uh, some of the export, uh, other um, uh, infrastructure exports. Um, if we look at the advanced economies, the numbers are kind of a mixed bag right now. Europe is still recovering, uh, but growth is expected to be only about 1%. Um, they are still facing a period of excessive debt, high unemployment rates, um, migrant crisis in Europe, as well as uh, the impending vote on whether uh, Britain remains in the euro area. Um, if you look at Japan, Japan's also similarly in a very low growth state. And both for Europe, for the European markets and the, Japan, the Japanese market, uh, this is this slow growth is coming despite the fact that there are very low interest rates uh, currently in the in the market, and they've actually cut interest rates uh, further. Uh, if we look at some of the the impacts of this low growth environment, uh, a lot of it has to do with the financial markets and the fact that uh, interest rates remain exceptionally low. You see here, these are 10-year bond yields. Uh, since the beginning of the year, they've actually uh, they actually fell off because of global growth concerns. They've stabilized, but they're still below where they were uh, a year ago. Japan, Japan is actually showing negative interest rates. Uh, European markets have uh, negative short-term rates as well. Similarly, I think that what we uh, this impact of the global market is also on the commodity space. We've seen about 11% drop in uh, U.S. dollar commodity prices for min metals and minerals. Again, a, a, a really a reflection of that weakening demand cycle in uh, in China. Uh, China is the, the largest demander or the largest buyer of uh, global uh, commodities, for example, copper and coal, steel, et cetera. Uh, and as they see that uh, weaker growth picture, it, it negatively impacts the, uh, the commodity pro, uh, profile here. So I think right now that the, the broad picture is still that uh, it's kind of a weak type of environment. Uh, that being said, I think there is some uh, positives. I think um, that the U.S. economy continues. Uh, the expectations for the economy in the U.S. remained quite positive. Um, there was a slowdown in the first quarter. Uh, part of this has to do with a uh, sluggish, a, a downturn in the export cycle due to a low, a low, uh, higher U.S. dollar. Uh, we also saw some impacts of low oil prices impacting uh, shale production in the uh, U.S. and, dr and drilling. Uh, but the current consensus is that uh, growth in the U.S. should return back to about a 2.5% rate. Uh, what's driving or what's going to be driving a lot of this growth is primarily on the consumption and housing side of the economy. Um, despite that weaker first quarter, we're still seeing a trend in the uh, in job growth of about 200,000 jobs per month right now in the U.S. That's a pretty, uh, pretty solid pace. Um, and even though we had about one month about so the latest month was about 160,000 jobs created. So that was kind of a, a little bit of a disappointment. Um, but uh, the overall picture right now in the U.S. remains um, a tightening labor market, about a 5% unemployment rate, uh, some rise in, the, in inflationary pressures. And, that, and all, those signal uh, an improving economy uh, and an improvement for uh, consumer demand going forward. Uh, and this, this improvement in the U.S. should, of course, help Canada um, in terms of our export sector, and, uh, and that's going to be one of the key drivers going forward. Uh, so I think for the, uh, in terms of the, uh, another factor here is that what's going to happen to the oil prices. So uh, these are somewhat inter intertwined, but the market for oil has shown a, a lot of fluctuations in the recent years. If you recall, it was about mid-2014 that Oil prices were around $100. It fell to low about January of uh, about $27 or so in uh, January of this year before stabilizing and returning back to about $50. Um, this is clearly a hot topic for Canada as it has been um, the key the key driver of a pummeling of economic growth here um, through income and investment channels. 
Uh, and where are we expecting uh, oil prices to go? Well, I think that's a good question. Uh, there is a lot of volatility in this market as we've already seen. Um, but right now the market as well as in forecast in general are expecting to see that the current price levels are will generally hold. Um, when we look at the current supply and demand imbalances, uh, there is undoubtedly uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, when we look at uh, quite a bit of tension right now for um, on the market in terms of the supply side, Saudi Arabia and Iran, there's tensions on downside risk as there is a market share war occurring. Um, there's also, however, on the upside, uh, U.S. production is, is uh, easing right now because of the low prices. We're seeing shale and rigs um, essentially shut down, and that's going to provide a, a sort of a, a floor for the overall pricing conditions. Um, we're also seeing that the low prices should help to uh, the low prices themselves should also help to, um, to lift demand in the consumer space. Uh, that's all, in uh, some of the economies of China, but also uh, in areas in the U.S. where we are seeing some increase in um, the number of mileage and, and the amount of cars uh, being purchased. And that should all uh, be helping the, uh, the overall oil demand picture. So I think the $50 oil uh, that we're seeing now is, our, is sort of the, the, the baseline that a lot of economists and what we're working with. Uh, and that's going to be the same going forward through 2017. Um, so I think right now that with the uh, a relatively subdued global outlook, um, what we have to look at for Canada is what's the impact here. And what we're seeing is that um, the overall impact in Canada um, has been a, a slowdown in overall economic activity. We saw uh, the um, the economy moved from about roughly about 2.5% uh, growth pace in about 2014, and that's moved down to about 1%. And what the big drag here has been that oil sector and the oil crash and how it has impacted our um, capital investment in the oil sands. Um, if you look on the right here, you see that business investment uh, actually fell on a quarter, a year-over-year -year basis in the fourth quarter of last year. It was about a 17% drop-off. If you compare that to other, the other um, expenditures, they're actually seeing some mild growth uh, occurring elsewhere in the economy. So it's really been isolated, although there are, uh, there have been some uh, spillovers of this impact uh, on the economy. Uh, if we look at where we're expecting to see or where the uh, economy is headed, um, the first quarter actually had a, a pretty modest growth pace. We had about a 2.4% um, uh, we ended up with about 2.4% growth in the economy uh, in the first quarter. However, it should be noted that that was all front-loaded. It was all because January had a very strong month for uh, GDP growth. Um, if we looked at what happened in February and March, we actually saw a contraction in the overall, uh, in the overall uh, economies. Uh, so what's going to happen in the second quarter is that we actually are, we have downgraded our own forecast for the second quarter. Uh, I have zero, as you can see here, it says zero roughly for second quarter in that big green dot. Um, but it's likely we're going to be negative. Uh, the impact of the Alberta wildfires is clearly going to be a, a drag on the economy. Um, when we're looking at the Alberta wildfires, we've seen about uh, roughly about half of the of the production in uh, the oil sand, at least, uh, really shut down, uh, or at least uh, temporarily at the very least, uh, to, um, uh, in, uh, in response. And we think that's going to have about 1.5% impact on the economy, uh, direct and indirect. Um, adding, that, adding to that some of, the weaker, some of the weak growth figures we've seen in recent quarters, we could easily see about a 1% drop off in the uh, a drop off in the economy of up to about 1% in the second quarter before uh, a, a significant rebound occurs in the third quarter. Uh, we expect to see uh, production come back online in the oil sands, but also some rebuilding efforts starting to boost growth. Nonetheless, I think that the, the current environment for Canada is that uh, we're going to see a, sub, a subpar growth this year, about 1.3%, before moving into about 2% um, going in uh, 2017 and 2018. Uh, what's going to be driving a lot of that, this growth on the going forward, is, is largely that, uh, that U.S. export or U.S. growth cycle boosting our export capacity or export activity, uh, as well as an increase in fiscal spending on the part of the federal government. Uh, so those are essentially the two more positive uh, types of um, uh, factors that could lift growth going forward. Uh, when we look at what uh, the expectation is for uh, the uh, interest rates, uh, what we expect to see is that given, uh, that, again, that weak first, relatively weak first quarter uh, of growth and recent trends, as well as uh, 
pretty, uh, I think, a mild inflationary pressures that are being boosted by some temporary exchange rate factors. We expecting that the uh, we expect to see that the you know, the Bank of Canada hold um, at their current rate of half percent all the way through until 2018. Um, that means that um, the long yields or you know um, everything like a mortgage rate, some short term um, uh, lines of credit, they're probably going to see a very stable, uh, um, very stable interest rate environment uh, at least for the next uh, couple of years, two years. Um, so what's happening in terms of the um, what, will, what does this mean for the uh, Canadian dollar? Well, uh, we saw a jump up in the Canadian dollar uh, to about 80 cents. Again, that was moving around with oil, but we have seen a backtrack into about 76 cents more recently. Um, and, and I think that the current levels are, are, actually, are actually about in line of where we had anticipated they'd, uh, them to be. Oil prices going up are definitely positive for the Canadian dollar. Uh, that being said, um, given the, the fact that the oil sands production has come off, uh, it's not, it's not uh, surprising that uh, even though oil prices are high, if we're not selling it or we can't get it to market, um, then uh, we are going to see that drop off in the Canadian dollar. Um, add to that is the, uh, is the potential, is the impact of um, the U.S. doing so well. We're expecting to see the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve increase their short-term rates while the Bank of Canada maintains their rate. Uh, and that's going to put, also put upward pressure uh, or sorry, uh, it's going to put some downward pressure on the Canadian dollar going forward uh, due to that uh, interest rate differential. Uh, so we are looking for about a, an average of about um, around 76 cents this year. We're moving back uh, over the next couple of years uh, into that 80 cent range or close to it. Um, so for Canada, I think that the overall story still remains quite uh, subdued. Um, but when we're looking at when we're moving across the country and look at different areas, we see the very different picture. It all depends on where you are. As I mentioned, that a lot of the, a lot of the weakness we've seen in the economy has come from the um, the oil and gas side as well as the business investment side. And not surprisingly, then um, the the fact that Canada only grew at about 28 percent last year was really a reflection of what happened in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the Newfoundland Labrador. Uh, we saw Alberta slump by about 4% in terms of their GDP or their economic activity last year. That was a huge drop off. Uh, um, but if you look on the other side, areas that are not as exposed to oil, um, Ontario, uh, sort of the manufacturing uh, um, uh, breadbasket for Canada, as well as BC, where we have some natural gas in the Northeast, but really we're not as, um, as uh, linked up to the current oil prices in terms of our economy. We saw about 3% growth uh, in BC, which was well above the national average and well above all other provinces last year. Uh, if we're looking forward to this year, I think it's more of the same. I don't see uh, too much of a, of a differential uh, in terms of economic growth from uh, 2015. I think that the key drivers of BC's economy are still in play. Uh, where you have the, the fact that energy, energy prices remain um, pretty steady and they're not very high, they're still uh, below where they were a few years ago. You also have uh, the low interest rates due to the Bank of Canada's cuts in 2015, buoying uh, not only consumer activity but also business investment. Um, you see a, a market here that there's a very strong housing market, and that's not only in uh, Vancouver, but also it's gravitating towards other regions or spreading out across the province. Um, the low Canadian dollar that we just discussed is going to be is already lifting the U.S. growth cycle, or sorry, lifting our exports as well as uh, with the U.S. growth cycle, um, and that is driving tourism activity in B.C., uh, movie and film activity, uh, manufacturing is also improving uh, on this front as well. So we're expecting to see um, around 3% growth again this year. In fact, I, I think we might be undercalling it, and based on this chart, it's probably going to be close to about 3.2%. Uh, a little bit higher, actually a little stronger than where it was in 2015. And, and as we move uh, forward, it'll be uh, pretty steady and above the Canadian average. So the, so the job picture in BC is probably our, one of the best um, indicators of where, of how the economy is performing. And what we can see here is that since about mid-20, early to mid-2015, uh, we have seen this a, a rapid increase in momentum for the job picture and jobs created. Uh, the most recent month, we had about a 4.9% year-over-year growth rate for employment in the, uh, in the province. Uh, and that was well above any other province in Canada. And uh, although I don't think that's going to hold largely because I think there was a blip in the data um, uh, relative to last year, I think what we're seeing here is still an average of about 3.5% uh, employment growth this year for uh, the province as a whole. 
Uh, and again, that's a very, that's a very significant number. Uh, if we look at uh, the impact of an economy and where it's also driving some of that consumer demand, so we definitely have the consumer demand coming from the uh, from the uh, the side of um, of the employment uh, picture, but also uh, the employment picture and jobs and a generally strong economy here in BC is actually driving more uh, migration into the province. When we look at the the migration numbers, uh, we've seen, it, especially in the interprovincial numbers, so individuals coming from other provinces. We've seen this positive, uh, a positive momentum since uh, since about 2013, uh, when other areas are doing poorly uh, and Alberta is not grow generating many jobs or and has a weak economy. Uh, you tend to see people moving more into the BC part of the um, part of the uh, country, um, and we are expecting to see here that uh, the interprovincial migration number is going to remain strong. We're going to see about 25,000. Uh, individuals from uh, net individuals from other provinces coming to BC this year. Uh, in contrast, though, the international numbers aren't haven't been very strong, but that's largely due to uh, a lot of net non-permanent residents or the non-permanent residents leaving the country, and that could be part of the temporary foreign worker shifts that we've seen in the most recent uh, recent couple of years. So overall, right now, though, we do have population growth being a key driver for. Uh, the BC's economy. Uh, we're expecting to see about 50,000 people added to BC each year going forward, uh, the combination of individuals from other parts of Canada, but also from other countries. Uh, when we look at other factors, um, I think that export cycle is, is clearly in play. Uh, on the services side for exports, we've seen this big increase in the number of tourists coming to uh, British Columbia, uh, largely, again, this is the international tourists. So we've seen a big jump up uh, at the highest level since the early 2000s, resulting uh, from uh, momentum from the U.S. visits as well as momentum from um, overseas and Chinese visitors to the region. And this is a reflection, a clear reflection of that low Canadian dollar driving tourism activity. Uh, adding to this is also individuals or residents in B.C. Um, maybe not going across, uh, not going to the U.S. for uh, uh, for uh, vacations due to the uh, the low Canadian dollar. Um, other exports, uh, when we're looking at the exports export for BC as a whole, we're also seeing that um, international goods exports for all the products that we ship overseas, uh, it's been pretty muted. It's roughly only about three percent growth. So that uh, on the face of it, it looks like a, a pretty weak number for British Columbia, but. A lot of this figure is based is being driven by low energy, uh, a lower energy exports. And when we so as a result, we have to really be clear that uh, the low energy exports really reflects pricing conditions, the low natural gas prices as well as low um, uh, low coal prices, and that's really dampening some of the dollar volume increase in exports in BC. If we were to take out a lot of these price impacts. Uh, what well, we're actually seeing is a much brighter picture in British Columbia right now for our international merchandise exports. We're shipping a lot of goods to other countries, and what we're looking at is probably real growth in the probably closer to about five percent or so for for British Columbia right now, rather than again a relatively muted or modest pace um, of about two and a half to three percent, and uh, again a weak growth in 2015. So, so I think our export numbers are definitely. Uh, are definitely improving, uh, and that would again reflect uh, the number of global factors for uh, the, the Canadian dollar as well as the stronger U.S. economy. Um, again, uh, again, these are all part of the same key themes that we're seeing: is that the British economy really outperforming other areas? Is that uh, retail sales activity um, uh, gearing off what's happening on the consumption side, but also what's happening on the tourism side? Uh, they're up about six percent this year, and that comes off of another six percent growth year last year. So it's very clear that. Um, we're, we're firing a lot of cylinders right now in British Columbia, uh, and, and that is going to continue to drive that job growth going forward. This, it's not all good news. There is some definitely weakness, uh, but it is being, I think, can, uh, being concentrated in uh, certain sectors of the economy. Uh, in particular, we have relatively weak commodity markets right now that continue to hamper investment. Uh, natural gas investment remains at a record low. Mine exploration is in decline, and there's also some a lot of uh, discussion or, or um, uncertainty regarding whether any LNG project will come to fruition. And when I say LNG, major LNG, I mean the ones in, in the northern BC, the multi multi billion dollar um, uh, projects. Uh, they they are facing some issues with environmental assessments, low pricing, and also uh, high levels of potential global supply, which could in fact have a, have a, could derail some of these plans going forward.
So if we just move um, just lastly to what's happening in the Vancouver area, I, I think right now Vancouver is in a very good position. Uh, if we look at uh, the current uh, state of employment numbers, we're actually up about over 5%. And, and so a lot of the growth in employment that we're seeing in, in BC is really uh, reflecting what's happening on the south coast of Vancouver and to a lesser extent Victoria. Uh, you are seeing uh, very strong housing markets in the region. You're also seeing, again, a lot of that tourism flows coming into uh, the lower mainland uh, southwest. Uh, you're seeing a lot of that um, just general uh, export-oriented services um, uh, helping the region as well right now. Uh, and this one, this chart here, or this table here, really just reflects uh, how much better I think Metro Vancouver is performing other, other key metro areas. You can see here in red, um, uh, the numbers are, are largely outperforming in sales and the housing sales in Metro Vancouver up about 30%, at least it, it, they were. Uh, Calgary was down about 30% in the fourth quarter year over year. You're seeing huge numbers of housing starts. Uh, unemployment rates are, are flat or declining. You're also seeing very strong uh, retail sales trends in the region comparatively to other Canadian cities. So that kind of, a lot of this, um, this growth, I think, in the economy is uh, reflected in at least partly the housing market. Um, we've undoubtedly seen a very voracious housing demand in Metro Vancouver over the past couple of years. We've seen demand uh, uh, essentially surge, uh, and of course, pricing has increased dramatically. Um, that being said, though, I think that we can only explain uh, the, the fact that the economy is doing well, population growth is, is, uh, is steady, it only explains part of the story for housing. Um, there is undoubtedly a disconnect right now between the economy uh, and incomes relative to housing prices. But when we see the, the prices right now, we're seeing about a 10% increase this year, just this year um, in the, the overall uh, price metrics for Metro Vancouver. Uh, but a lot of this happening is happening in the single detached market. So there is um, increases in both, the, um, in both townhome and condo markets. Uh, but they're definitely at a slower pace than what we've seen in uh, the single detached market. And if you're on the right-hand side, you can see that um, over the past, essentially since about 2010, uh, the median price for detached condo, uh, detached house versus a condominium uh, has increased about 2.8 2 times, or almost three times the price of a, of a uh, condo or apartment condo compared to about two times in 2010. Um, so, What's driving this? I think there's a, there's a lot of reasons. Part of it is the demand. Uh, we are seeing high levels of demand in the region right now for sales across not only Lower Mainland, but also in the Fraser, uh, in Metro Vancouver, but also in the Fraser Valley areas. Uh, these are essentially the, uh, some record high levels of uh, housing activity right now. The other component to high demand, though, is, um, is a low supply environment. We've seen uh, inventories in Metro Vancouver really uh, drop off uh, dramatically. Uh, if you look at the, the red line here, it's the number of active listings, so existing home inventory in the market. And that's essentially the lowest in over a decade, more than 15 years. We haven't seen inventories this low, even though, again, demand is quite high. And, and if you add that to the, um, the number of new unoccupied, so essentially uh, pre-built homes or built homes that uh, were spec homes, those have also been uh, falling to the lowest level since about 2007. And when we combine these two, the demand and supply factors, what you see is an accelerating market. So it's no surprise to us that uh, given this environment, that prices are excelling at a, accelerating at a rapid pace. Um, that being said, we do think that there is a little bit of frost coming in. There's definitely an increased speculation than there was in the market previously. Um, that is driving some of, this, uh, some of this activity, but we don't see a real stoppage in this momentum. We actually have further price gains in both the detached markets. Uh, a lot of that's being driven by the lack of availability of land. So there's a supply issues uh, inherent in, our, in, the, in the Metro Vancouver area. Uh, we expect to see detached homes continue to outpace uh, growth in the attached in the apartment markets. Um, I think uh, what we need to see and what we are seeing already is a response uh, to the market right now in terms of increased supply. Uh, and this is really the key, I think the key factor of how do we, how do we alleviate and how do we um, keep pressure or at least alleviate some of the pressure in the housing market is to build more. Uh, well, we need to build more available housing and uh, in the market. A lot of housing starts we're seeing ramping up to the highest level right now since about 2006, 2007. And that's, uh, that's a direct response to the low, uh, to that low inventory level. So, when, when we're talking about the housing market, I think there's a lot of complexities involved. There's obviously there's strong local economic growth 
Uh, there's also low interest rates driving our market as well. Uh, household debt levels are quite high, even though debt servicing ratios are uh, quite stable, owing mostly to the fact that interest rates are so low. Uh, we're also seeing a, a lot of this demand coming from demographic drivers, where you have uh, both millennials as well as boomers, both in the market at the same time. Uh, millennials, of course, wanting to get into the housing market and boomers having a lot of um, housing activity. So you add those together, you get a little, again, another increase in overall demand in the market. Um, we can't discount the impact of global demand on foreign capital and income. I don't think it's um, as necessary, as large of an impact as, uh, as, as some would argue, uh, but there is some ripple effect into the, into the remainder of the region. So if you do have high, um, high luxury product homes in the market being sold for very high prices, it typically would lead to rippling across, uh, across the region into other areas. But I think the key, uh, one of the key aspects here is still going to be the limited land base for expansion, the fact that we have these severe uh, land and supply and inventory constraints in the market, and those aren't going away uh, in the short term. We actually do need a lot more uh, in terms of existing uh, housing stock to, um, to alleviate this pressure. When we look at the long term of housing uh, in the region, I think that you know there's there's undoubtedly there's been corrections in the past. There's going to be corrections in the future as well, uh, and corrections can be quite large. These are already adjusted for inflation. So you do see in 1980s there was a large drop off in housing prices. Same with with the uh, in the 1990s in real housing prices, even though nominal or uh, nominal prices remain flat. What we're looking at right now is that if we want to see a, a significant drop off in pricing. What we expect to see is that we need a recession or some type of external, major external shock that would impact not only the employment numbers in uh, Vancouver, but also uh, the overall confidence levels in the Vancouver housing market. Uh, in our forecast, we don't see that happening. We actually see a, a pretty uh, steady growth cycle for the province and the region going forward. Um, if, we, if prices continue to rise, I, I do think that's going to crimp demand. We're definitely going to see some um, demand destruction in the market where individuals just are going to be priced out. And what that happens there is that prices would typically flatline or flatten out a little bit more. Uh, you wouldn't see the, quite the same level of, of growth and uh, you would see uh, sales dropping. Uh, so I think that's the more likely scenario going forward uh, as prices continue to march higher. Um, so again, again, this is just the last slide here for land utilization. And the key factor for I think Vancouver is that it's becoming a more dense type of environment. A much a lot more people come to the region. The land base itself does not expand very much in Vancouver over the past 30 years compared to other cities. Uh, so what we're going to be needing is again more high density housing as well as I think families looking for the white picket fence will have to continue to look eastward uh, and outside of the core area. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's part of the key point for the housing market. We do expect to see ongoing price increases and uh, pretty high sales levels due to demand um, and also that supply constraint. Um, overall, I think the overall economic outlook for BC is quite strong and we're actually looking at, again, a stronger um, Metro Vancouver area relative to the rest of the province. And again, that housing market activity uh, being pretty steady. Um, broadly and uh, with a further home price appreciation. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'd, I'm happy to take them through the, uh, through the uh, system. And otherwise, I'll leave it back to uh, Michael. Thank you so much, Brian. That was, that was uh, really informative, and I think it gives a really good picture of what's going on with the global economy, the provincial uh, uh, Canadian economy, and then uh, particularly what's happening in Metro Vancouver. Um, I don't see any questions on the Q&A, but I really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us, Brian. Um, I think if, uh, if, uh, of, if any of the attendees do have questions, feel free to contact one of our uh, financial planners or um, one of our um, advice experts at GNF, and we'll be happy to um, get the information for you or uh, give you some insight into some of the questions that you may have. Um, I think uh, the other thing that we'll try to do is we'll also try and send uh, these, this uh, recording out to you if you're interested, or we will post it on the uh, web as well. So um, there'll be a couple of uh, opportunities to follow up if interested. Again, thank you uh, so much for joining us. I really appreciate um, everybody. Um, taking the time to join us, and particularly, Brian, thank you for uh, spending the time with us and putting together this really informative presentation. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.